you, brother. I hear what God has laid on your heart. Thank you, brother. He was considered to be the fastest man in the world. He was called the Flying Scotsman. At 22 years of age, in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris, France, Eric Little was scheduled to run the 100-meter dash, an event in which he was almost guaranteed to win the gold medal. However, just a few days before the medal race was run, it was announced that the qualifying heats for the 100 meter were going to be run on a Sunday. Now, Eric Little was a very strong Christian with very strong convictions about the Lord's Day. And even though it meant giving up a chance to run and win a gold medal for Great Britain, Eric Little determined he was not going to run on a Sunday. Now, as you might imagine, a huge uproar followed. The Olympic Committee of Great Britain called an emergency meeting, sent a message to Eric Little and said, Eric, you ain't got a choice, you got to run. He refused. The King of England sent a personal message to Little saying the same thing. You cannot let your country down. You must run. He remained unmoved. He was summoned to a personal meeting with the Prince of Wales who brought unbelievable pressure to bear on Eric, but he determined to remain steadfast. Finally, he received a telegram from the British Prime Minister which said, Eric, you have got to run this race. But Eric Little's commitment not to run held firm. In spite of incredible pressure that was placed on him, Eric Little understood he had a critical decision he had to make. Would he please his country? Would he please his king? Would he please himself? Or would he please God? Eric Little made the very difficult, but for him, the right response and made the right choice. He said, I will please God. Church, the longer I live, the more convinced I have become that this is the critical issue of our time, and it is certainly the critical question for every one of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Who do I want to please the most? Do I want to please other people? Do I want to please myself? Or do I want to please God? And if I dare to say that I want to please God, what does that really mean then for me? What does it mean for my life? What does it mean for my future? Well, I want to see if we can answer that question this morning by looking at what pleasing God meant in the life of one man whose name will be very familiar to you. The Old Testament hero of the faith, Moses. Now, even though Moses was one of the great figures in the Old Testament, I want us to look at his life this morning from a New Testament perspective as it is boiled down, condensed, summed up, and presented to us in three verses found in the 11th chapter of the New Testament book of Hebrews. So, let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word or your phone or your tablet or whatever it is you may be using this morning, and let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. We'll also put these verses up on the screen. God's Word says this, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered 
the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his reward. Now folks, this is an amazing biography. An amazing biography. And it's hard for us, really, to get our heads around some of this. And that's because, can I be real honest this morning? <laughs> it's, 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 it's because, I think, our contemporary version of Christianity has become so infused with materialism and consumerism with personal security and success, with comfort and convenience, that it has become increasingly difficult for us to do what Moses did. But here is the essential truth, church, that I believe is literally screaming out at us from these verses we have just read, and it is this. If I am serious about my faith, if I am serious about following Jesus Christ, then I must make pleasing God more important than pleasing anyone else, even myself. So when we're talking about pleasing God, what is it we're really talking about? That is the critical question, right? Because if I want to please God, I need to understand what it really means to please God. So I want to show you several things from our text this morning. Here's the first one. Pleasing God in its most basic, foundational, simplest form that I can give it to you. Pleasing God simply means saying yes to God. It means when God comes to me and he says, Alan, this is what I want you to do. Then I say, okay, God, if this is what you want me to do, then this is what I will do. I will say yes to you, God. That is what it means to please God. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, this entire chapter is filled with the names of men and women who said yes to God. You can look at some of them there. Abel said yes to offering God a proper sacrifice. Enoch said yes to walking with God for 300 years. Noah said yes to God and built an ark. Abraham said yes to leaving his country and his father's household and going to a place he did not know. Rahab said yes to hiding the Israelite spies even though it put her own life at risk. Gideon said yes to taking on the entire Midianite army with only a handful of Israelite soldiers. Hebrews chapter 11 is filled with men and women who said yes to God. In fact, if you've got your Bible open to Hebrews chapter 11, if you look at verse 5, the last part, now speaking of Enoch here, it says specifically Enoch was commended as one who what? pleased God. Pleasing God, church, means saying yes to God. It means, it means saying yes to whatever it is He wants you to do. That means when God speaks to you from His Word, by His Spirit, through His messenger, church, then your response and my response should not be, okay, Lord, uh, let me think about it. Or let me sleep on it. Or let me seek counsel about it. Or even, Lord, let me pray over it. No, when God says, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to go. This is how I want you to live. Then our response must be an immediate, yes, Lord. Or we will never please God. Because that's what pleasing God means. It means saying yes to God. Now, I hope that's fairly clear. But is it easy? <laughs> that's another question, right? That is another question. So, 
Let's look at a second thing. Because this is not easy and we need to understand this. Second thing I want you to see from this text is, if, I, if I'm going to say yes to God, then that means I'm going to have to sometimes say no to myself. If I'm going to say yes to God, that means I'm going to have to sometimes say no to myself. Um, I'm, I'm, it's going to automatically mean saying no to some other things in my life. Now, this is exactly what Moses had to do. Look at verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, do you see that word refused? That word means to reject something, to disown something. It means to deny yourself something. It means, quite simply, to say no to something. You see, when Moses said yes to God, it meant saying no to himself. It meant saying no to being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Remember now, because this is important, Moses was a Hebrew. He was Jewish. Although he grew up in the palace of the Egyptian king, the Pharaoh. Me Moses was the crown prince of Egypt, second in command, next in line to the throne. He had popularity. Everybody knew him. He had power. Everybody else's wish, or, or his wish was everybody else's command. He had, he had comfort. He had, he had security. He had stability. But a time came in Moses' life when he had a decision to make. What was going to be more important? Pleasing God or pleasing himself? Saying yes to God or saying yes to himself? And when Moses decided to say yes to God, he understood it was going to also mean saying no to himself. Now, it's, it's very interesting to me that in verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused, said no to being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We really are talking about growing up here, folks. We're talking about Christian maturity. We're talking about coming face to face with the question, is it better to say yes to ourselves and please ourselves, or is it better to say yes to God and please God, even when that means saying no to ourselves? You see, when Moses said yes to God, he understood it meant saying no to Pharaoh. It meant saying no to Egypt. It meant saying no to himself. In fact, if you look at verse 25, it says, He, Moses, chose, that is, he made a conscious decision. He chose rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now, don't misunderstand what this is saying here. When you see the fleeting pleasures of sin, it's not talking about Moses being tempted to participate in the pagan, immoral practices of Egyptian culture. There's absolutely no indication in Scripture that Moses was ever involved in those kinds of things. That's not what he's talking about. Here's what he's talking about. If Moses had stayed in Egypt, he would have sinned, but the sin would have been choosing to please himself instead of pleasing God. His sin would have been hanging on to his position, hanging on to his status, hanging on to his power, hanging on to his comfort and security for his own pleasure instead of letting go of those things so that he could do the thing God wanted him to do and please God. You see, church, choosing to please yourself at the expense of pleasing God is a sin. We need to understand that. Choosing to please yourself at the expense of pleasing God is a sin. Now, 
There's nothing wrong with pleasing yourself sometimes, okay? That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But to hold on to something when God says, let go. To stay where you are when God says, I need you to be somewhere else. That is a sin, even when what you have and where you are brings you a lot of pleasure. Let me show you another verse. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to it so you can actually eyeball it yourself. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus is speaking. This is what he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. You know what that means? It means to say no to himself. If anyone would come after me, let him say no to himself, take up his cross, and then you can follow me. You see, denying yourself, church, saying no to yourself, is an indispensable, integral part of the Christian life. This is not a higher life we're talking about. This is not a deeper life. This is normal Christianity. It it seems abnormal to us sometimes because, again, our American version of the faith has almost pre-programmed us to avoid anything that might make us say no to ourselves. It seems abnormal to us because pleasing ourselves or pleasing others has far too often become more important than pleasing God. So what's the answer here? How, how do we come to grips with what we hate to do, and that is say no to ourselves? How do we come to grips with doing what God's Word says we have to do to really please Him? Well, thankfully God's Word gives us the answer here, as it always does. Third thing. It becomes easier to say no to myself. Now, those words, I've chosen them very carefully, okay? I'm not saying it's ever going to be easy. Christianity is not easy. The Word of God never says that following Christ will be easy. In fact, the very opposite. But it becomes easier for me to say no to myself when I understand that the blessings God has given me He has given me, not for my own personal pleasure, rather, He has given those things to me for His greater purposes. And this this to me is the really cool thing about Moses' life. I want you to remember how Moses came to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. How did that happen? How did he come to his position of influence and power and success? Well, if you remember the story, you'll remember that when Moses was born, the Egyptian pharaoh sent out an edict to kill all of the Hebrew baby boys because the Israelites were multiplying in Egypt, and Pharaoh was afraid they might rise up against him. They were a threat to him. So Moses said, we're going to kill every Hebrew baby boy. Moses was one of those. But God led Moses' parents, if you remember, to put him in a basket and float him down the Nile River. And God arranged it so that that basket just happened to float by the place where Pharaoh's daughter was taking a bath. And God arranged it so that she just happened to look over and see that basket with that baby. And God arranged it so that it just happened that she began to feel a compassion for that baby and decided to take him into her home and adopt him as her son. Listen, this whole thing was God's idea. It was God's idea to put Moses in Pharaoh's palace. But it was never God's plan for Moses to stay in Pharaoh's palace for the rest of his life. Why? Because God is a long-range planner. And he knew that his people were going to be in slavery in Egypt. And so his plan was to use the time Moses spent in Pharaoh's palace to prepare him for the time he would lead God's people out of Egypt. You see, when God got ready to rescue his people from Egypt, (laughs) 
He was going to need somebody who knew Egypt. He was going to need somebody who had the cultural background and awareness of Egypt. He was going to need somebody who understood the customs and the thinking of the Egyptians. He was going to need somebody who knew enough about a Pharaoh that he could walk right into Pharaoh's palace, look him boldly in the eyes, and say, let my people go. See, that's why God made Moses the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's why he gave him his position. That's why he gave him his power. That's why he gave him all of those things. Those blessings weren't for Moses' pleasure. They were for God's greater purpose. Now, let me be very transparent and honest here for just a moment. And let me include myself in what I'm about to say. Okay? I put myself at the head of any line I'm forming here. Okay. Some of us have taken God's blessings and we've decided these are our blessings. We've decided the things that God has given to us have been given to us for our pleasure and our purposes. No, no, no. Listen, God gives us the things we have. He puts us in the places we are because he has a greater purpose in mind. There's something greater he's wanting to do, and that is why we must always be asking ourselves, God, as I look at the things you've given me, how do you want to use these things to advance your purposes? God, as I look at where I am today, how is this preparing me for some place you might want to place me tomorrow? You see, we've got to ask those questions, and the reason why we've got to ask those questions is because I hope we are interested in the will of God. If we're simply interested in our own will, then the only question we really need to ask is what pleases me, right? But if we're interested in the will of God, we must ask what pleases God. And that means we must be willing to give up anything, walk away from anything, let go of anything, move away from anything, so we can get to the place God wants us to be for the sake of his greater purposes, which is to draw a lost world unto himself. Are you uncomfortable yet? Okay, this is a little hard, a little edgy, not sure it's worth it. I understand. Fourth thing, that's why I need to show you this final thing. Here's, here it is, number four. When I choose God's pleasure, when I choose to say yes to God, even if it means saying no to myself, when I choose God's pleasure, I get God's reward. Look at verse 26. Moses, it says, Moses considered the reproach of Christ of greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to what? His reward. Now, the wording here seems a little bit odd because Moses obviously lived in Old Testament times, right? He didn't know the Christ of the New Testament that you and I know. But the writer of Hebrews still says Moses considered the reproach of Christ. I like other translations better which read Moses considered reproach for the sake of Christ as being of greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. Now, here's where historical context becomes really important for us to understand what's happening here. You see, the author of Hebrews, even though he's looking back at Old Testament history, he is dealing with New Testament reality. He is writing to first century Christians who were beginning to to really kind of lose their favored, comfortable place in society. They were beginning to experience mistreatment themselves. They were beginning to experience marginalization. They were being pushed to the edges of the culture. They were beginning to experience persecution because of their connection to Christ. And so they were beginning to flirt with the idea of, hey, maybe we can begin to back away from Christ a little bit so that we can better fit in with the culture. So the author of Hebrews takes the Old Testament example of Moses and he uses it to encourage not only those first century believers but those of us who are 21st century believers because 
every one of us, every believer has to determine how we're going to deal with the allure of the treasures of Egypt. Every one of us has to ask the question, am I an, a, an Egyptian or am I a Hebrew? Am I the son of Pharaoh's daughter? Or am I a son or a daughter of God? Every one of us has to deal with the pull, the pressure, the temptation of the world, the culture, our society, which are constantly telling us, do the things that will please yourself. Don't say no to yourself. Do the things that please you instead of doing the things that please God. We're all dealing with that. So how do you handle that pressure? How did, how did Moses deal with it? Well, watch this. Last part of verse 26 says he was looking ahead to his reward. In other words, Moses was playing the long game. Okay? He was looking ahead. He was looking down the road. He was willing to forego the immediate gratification that would come from pleasing himself because he believed with all of his heart that there was something so much better down the road waiting on him if he would choose to please God. In fact, verse 26 says he considered something. That word considered means to calculate something. It means to weigh something out. That's exactly what Moses did. He weighed these things out. Okay, son of Pharaoh's daughter, mistreatment with the people of God. Treasures of Egypt, reproach for the sake of Christ. Son of Pharaoh's daughter, son of God. He weighed those things out carefully. And when he did, he determined, he became convinced that pleasing God was better than pleasing himself because there was a reward for pleasing God. Now, what was the reward? That's the question, right? Some folks will say, well, obviously the reward was heaven. I don't really think that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here, even though I am sure Moses was looking forward to going to heaven. Uh, by the way, I hope you're looking forward to going to heaven. That's not what it's talking about here. Sometimes I think we get a little bit too caught up in when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And I do believe that. That's true. But church, there is an awful lot of rejoicing we could get in on right here and right now if we would ever understand what God can do with a life that is totally sold out to pleasing Him. You see, when Moses left Egypt, he didn't get to be the next Pharaoh. But you know what? That's a good thing. Because Pharaoh and his army got drowned in the Red Sea, if you remember. But Moses walked with God. Moses talked with God. He saw the burning bush. He heard the heavenly voice. And when he came back to Egypt some 60 years later with his shepherd's staff in his hand, what scripture calls the rod of God, he absolutely controlled the agenda in Egypt. He held out that rod, and the waters of the mighty Nile River turned to blood. He held out that rod, and impenetrable darkness covered the land. He held out that rod, and great plagues devastated the nation of Egypt. He came to the Red Sea, and he held out that rod, and he said to God's people, Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. And the waters of the Red Sea parted. And God's people crossed over on dry land. Moses ate manna from heaven. He drank water out of a rock. 
He became the great spiritual leader of Israel. And he led God's people to the promised land. And when he died, if you look at Deuteronomy 34, 6, an amazing statement. When Moses died, Scripture says God himself buried him. And if that's not enough, in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus appeared in all of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Moses and Elijah who appeared with him. Now you just, you tell me church, I'll let you make the decision. You tell me which was the better deal. Okay, if Moses had stayed in Egypt and pleased himself, we would have never heard of him. We wouldn't be talking about him today. He'd be some mummy in King Tut's tomb. You see, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes, and even though according to the standards of the world today, it may not look like it, it is worth it to go all the way with God. It is worth it to say yes to God. It is worth it to please God because when you choose God's pleasure, you get God's reward. Not the temporary, transient pleasures of this world, but the great reward of God. Now, I didn't finish my story about Eric Little, so let me finish it. After Eric Little decided he was not going to run the qualifying heats for the 100-meter dash because they were going to be run on a Sunday, a teammate of his on the British track and field team, Harold Abrams, offered to swap events with him. Now, Harold Abrams was Jewish, so he didn't have a problem with running on a Sunday. The problem was that Harold Abrams ran the 400-meter, not the 100. The 400-meter race was something that Eric Little had never trained for. It wasn't his strength. Nevertheless, he agreed to swap events. On the day that the 400 meters were going to be run, just before the the, the runners got into their starting blocks, an American trainer for the American Olympic team came up and handed Eric Little a note. It was very simple what it said. God honors those who honor Him. God honors those who honor Him. The starting gun sounded. Eric Little not only ran the 400 meter, but he won the gold medal. And not only did he win the gold medal, he set a world's record that lasted for over a decade. He became overnight a national hero. He could have had anything he wanted. All he had to do was say jump, and all of Great Britain would have said what? How high? And yet, one year after winning the gold medal, Eric Little walked away from fame. He walked away from fortune. He walked away from everything to become a missionary with the London Missionary Society. He went to China where he carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the back country of that vast nation. When World War II broke out and Japan invaded China, Eric Little was captured by the Japanese and classified as an enemy national. He was placed in a prisoner of war camp along with 2,000 other allied prisoners, packed into a facility a little bigger than a football field, housed in a room three feet by six feet. He was starved. He was physically abused and tortured. He was denied medical care. Yet, he organized athletic events, taught hymns, and ministered God's word to his fellow prisoners and to his Japanese captors. Just a few months before the end of the Second World War, before the liberation of China, On February the 21st, 1945, Eric Little died in that prisoner of war camp. He was buried in a garden behind the Japanese officer's quarters, his grave marked only by a small wooden cross. That burial site was forgotten 
until it was rediscovered in 1989 on the grounds of what is now the Waifeng Middle School in Shandong Province, China, about a six hours drive from Beijing. That camp, which once held Eric Little and 2,000 other Japanese prisoners of war, is now a place that teaches 2,000 Chinese teenagers. <laughs> Every new student at that school is taught about that prisoner of war camp and about Eric Little's achievements both on and off the track. The building where Eric Little died has been turned into a museum with a reconstruction of Little's prison room there and a wax figure of him inside. It is a remarkable honor for a Christian missionary in a communist country. It is worth it to please God. You see, the circumstances for you and me are very different, perhaps. But the question is still the same. Will I please others? Will I please myself? Or will I please God? It's the most important question you'll ever ask. And your answer will make all the difference in both time and eternity. Would you pray with me? Heaven. Man, what an exciting morning of worship at Brushy Creek Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Corey, and I want to say thank you for joining us online. What a blessing it is to have you tune in and worship the Lord with us. At Brushy Creek, we're a place that's always trying to offer hope and build community. And my prayer is that we've helped do that for you this morning. I want to invite you to come join us some Sunday at Brushy Creek. We'd love to have you be our guest. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see ways in which you can contact us and let us know you're coming. Or maybe you have a prayer request or a need or some way we can help you find hope and build community. We're not a perfect church. We're not perfect people. But we serve a perfect Savior, and we'd love for you to come join us on that journey. I hope you have a great week, and God bless you.